You are the best people evolved for mankind because you enjoin the good and you forbid the evil. America's greatest chance, without a doubt, are the Muslims who do their job. Let us be very, very clear that our presence here in the United States of America is the best thing that ever happened to this country. The Islamophobia industry is spending millions of dollars to demonize Islam for one reason, and that is to break away your confidence from your faith, because it recognizes that your faith is the source of our success and strength as Muslims and as human beings in this country. Our job is simply to show the oneness of Allah. That's our struggle, and if we do that, America benefits. We live in a country where we need to understand our history as Muslims. Islam has been on the shores of this nation since the days of its founding. This country right here is our country, and we deserve to live here like everybody else. We praise Allah, send peace and blessings upon uh, our beloved messenger Muhammad upon his pure family, uh, his companions and those who follow them until the end of time. Assalamu alaikum everybody. Once again, as I said earlier, it's great to be into, in the city of Imam Jamil El Amin, uh, H. Rat Brown. Uh, we pray for his freedom. Uh, we pray that he will be exonerated, insha'Allah ta'ala. Uh, we pray for his sister Karima, uh, Imam Nadim, and the community there in the West End. You should visit that community. You know, pay tribute to the historical roots of Islam in this country before the West End gets gentrified. And gentrified with a J. Gentrified. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, there was a number of really powerful things that were said, uh, but I think as uh, our brother Mahmoud mentioned, you know, uh, we are experiencing uh, interesting times uh, in this country. Uh, some of them are moments of extreme euphoria and happiness. Uh, the number of people now who are allying with the Muslim community. Um, recently, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I was walking to the subway. And this lady came up to me and she's like, would you like to help me ally with the Muslims? I was like, I am Muslim. She's like, well, would you like to help yourself? MashaAllah. No, but that's, that's real talk, you know? And I said, yeah, sure. I mean, who doesn't want to help themselves? And, and this was a woman who was not necessarily very religiously uh, inclined, um, you know, somewhat on the far left, but just like really passionate uh, about being an ally uh, and deliberate uh, to the Muslim community. Um, at the same time, these are tremendous challenges that are emblematic of what's going on in this country. Uh, in general, we're faced with a, a toddler uh, as a president who, if he, it's true, and I say that not to make fun of him, just calling a spade a spade, uh, who doesn't get what he wants or somehow riled up, will not hesitate to really, for the first time, uh, exhibit some of the characteristics of certain components of white America uh, that white Americans as well as people of color have known existed for years. Uh, my grandmother used to say in Oklahoma, if you put stuff under the rug too much, one day you're going to trip and bust your nose. You know, she asked me to sweep the house, I put stuff under the rug. And she said, if you keep doing that, you're going to be the one eventually to fall on his face. So there's just a few things I think we can do uh, in these important times. And the first and foremost is to really understand that all of these events and all of these situations have a Lord. You know, just like when Abraha came to destroy the Kaaba and the Prophet Sallallahu his grandfather, reminded him that this house has a Lord who will take care of this house. This deen has a Lord who will take care of this deen. So for us, what we should really do is focus on creating a strong relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Because when we have a strong relationship with Allah, we will not become hypnotized by success, nor will become apathetic or distressed with hard times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam by saying, Wala tamnun tastakthir. Like don't, don't think about the good that you do because the good is from Allah. Someone who's really a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be co-opted or bought. They can't be sold out. Inna Allah ashtara min al-mu'minina anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al-jannah. Allah said the believers have sold to Allah their lives and their properties. They understand, you know, لا تلهيهم تجارته ولا بيع عن ذكر الله. No amount of wealth, no amount of opulence, no amount of success can take them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they understand وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ أُنِيبُ Not one step, not one breath, not one blink of the eye, not one beating of the heart, not one successful interfaith event, not meeting with some super awesome politician, not having Instagram likes for days, whatever it is. None of that can happen without Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the thing that we have to worry about as the climate in America increases and overseas, people are trying to influence Islam in this country. We can experience and expect a lot of people to sell out. And they may sell out because of monetary gain. They may sell out for pro promises of fame. And they may sell out just because they want to be close to Chuck. But somebody who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understands وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ There's no success except with Allah. وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ is not going to get intoxicated by success because they understand it. They understand that without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no success. And that's why in the Qur'an, words are written in the past tense. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who believed to remind you that it was written before creation that you would be a believer. Those who did in the past is meant to remind us, you, you didn't have the power to do this, but Allah blessed you to be able to do this. The second is that when someone has this functional relationship with Tawheed, they're not going to be distraught by hard times or difficulties. هَذَا مَا وَعَدَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ those companions of the Prophet ﷺ in the Battle of Khandaq, which our brother Mahmoud just talked about, when they saw all those tribes surrounding Medina, they said, man, this is the promise of God. This is the promise that the Messenger told us about, ﷺ. And that's why towards the middle and end of the seerah, instead of talking about don't get caught up in your success, what does Allah say? وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't get depressed. Don't get rocked. Because every hal has a rub. Just like the Kaaba has a Lord, every situation, every success, every loss, every moment of struggle and challenge has a Lord and that Lord is Allah. And we believe Allah is good. إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَلَى طَيِّبْ لا يقبل إلا طيب. إن الله تعالى طيب لا يقبل إلا طيبة. Allah is good and He only accepts good. And that allows us to have a relationship that transcends just the monetary. To move beyond just protecting your bag. You know now people say protect the bag like protect your wealth. Like you walk out of bank, right? Protect your bag. Protect your jannah. Protect your hereafter. Because when we have that kind of relationship with Allah, where we believe in Him and we trust in Him, and we understand success is from Him and hardships are from Him, doesn't matter. Ibn Qayyim said, you should be with Allah like the dead person being washed. Like whatever comes your way, alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. But that opens up a door for a relationship that moves beyond the dunya. 
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the guider of the hearts, the control of the hearts, the control of all things. Allah says to Sayyidina Muhammad, when you threw the dust, you didn't throw the dust. Allah threw it. I experienced this in a very unique way. I myself, like Brother Mahmoud, am someone who was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be Muslim. But last, you know, last uh, May, I received a message from a young person on Snapchat, basically said to me, what do Muslims believe about dreams? Because we believe that our relationship with the Prophet and his family and the righteous people uh, extends beyond physical laws. Our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends beyond physical laws. When you send salawat upon the Prophet, what does he do? He answers you. The hadith, authentic hadith says, there's an angel next to my grave that tells me every time someone sends salawat upon me and they mention your name to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why the Shafi Madhab in Medina, when you pray, you start the Salaam to the left first, not to the right, because the Prophet is next to you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this sister, she hits me up, she's from Canada, home of bad coffee and mediocre sports teams. And I'm sorry, I'm a big Celtics fan, Shake. You gotta forgive me. It's just, it's just a Kyrie thing. KG, Paul Pierce, Robert Parrish. Back when you could actually like check people on the perimeter without getting pulled out of the game. But I experienced this, you know, sometimes things happen and you're reminded like, Allah is all powerful, everything gonna be all right. So she said to me, what do Muslims believe about dreams? So I gave her like a little spill, you know. And then she said, I need, I need to talk to you about something. I didn't know who this person was. So I got spooked. I said, entrapment going on nowadays, man. So I said, yeah. She said, I keep seeing this dream of Muhammad, man. I keep seeing this dream of Muhammad. I said, really, what's he doing? He said, like, he's hugging me. And he's telling me, I've been waiting for you. I said, what? I said, whoa, this, this sister's a wali, man. Like, this is Arif Billah, man. I said, really? Like, what family are you from? Like, what's your name? She said, no, I'm not Muslim. But like, I keep having this dream over and over and over again that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is like grabbing me and telling me, like, welcome back. And I don't, I don't understand why I'm having these dreams. So we continued to engage, you know, back and forth. And then on, on the first night of Ramadan, well, hold on a second. I said, man, there's something about you that you're not telling me. You know, there's something going on here. And she said, okay, I was adopted to a Catholic family. And they have told me that my parents were Muslims. And then she said to me, so what do you think the dream means? And I said, listen, I'm not the most pious guy, you know. Um, there's a difference between fatwa and taqwa. I said, honestly, I think that it's telling you that if your physical father has left you, your spiritual father is calling you back home. The Prophet is close to the believers. Maybe her parents are righteous people. We, we, don't, we shouldn't judge them. We don't know what was going on. Right? But Allah protects the children of the righteous. We believe that. That's that law that goes beyond physical law. Alhamdulillah, she took shahada. First night of Ramadan. But it doesn't stop there, man. One day, she sends me this picture in Arabic of like Shajarat al-Ayla, you know, like the family tree. 
And she's like, can you please translate this for me because this is my lineage. This is the only document I have from my family that says anything about who my parents were, my grandparents, and where I'm from. So I said, yeah, give me, you know, give me a few days and I'll get to work. So I started to translate this sister's lineage. And she's from the family of the Prophet Her family are Ashraf. And we believe that, you know, the family of the Prophet has barakah. There's so many hadith, 40 hadith about the barakah of the family of Sayyidina Muhammad. The point is like, who looked after her, man? Who brought her home? Who guided her back? So the point I'm making is like, our relationship with Allah is very powerful. It doesn't excuse us of responsibility. It should not be used as a liability. But this sister's like Rey from Star Wars, man. Like she's like the lost Jedi. No, seriously, like it's incredible. And she went to the masjid for the first time with cornrows, you know, and baggy pants or skinny jeans now, I guess. And she was kicked out of the masjid. The family of the Prophet was kicked out of the masjid because we don't know how to welcome people. So then the next two months, I'm trying to navigate where she lives, which I won't say, just to find her a place to go. And one of the people, one of the places I was able to try to connect her to is like, why Islam? So that takes us to the work that Ikna is doing. You know, the first pamphlet I ever read, I took from a follower of Imam Jamil, who is selling sensorial oils and incense. If you're from old school Atlanta, you know about sensorilia. Blue love and Somali rose, man. Egyptian musk and Firdos. And that pamphlet, Islam at a Glance, I went home, my mother, God bless her, country woman from Oklahoma, Ain't no Muhammad stuff going down in the house, man. Nah, nah, bro. You're going to eat that bacon and be happy. <laughs> so I took the pamphlet and hid it in the restroom. Because I said, man, if mama sees like this Islam stuff, boy. And I started reading it. And then I remember on the back, Islamic Circle of North America. Who donated the money for that pamphlet? I don't know. Those are the akhfiya. So that takes me to the second point. The first point is understanding like we have a, a, a it's an honor to make sujood to Allah. It's an honor to submit to Allah. But the second is infrastructure building. The challenges that we face, the, the, the very sophisticated challenges that we face demand that we create platforms for people to, to, to be supported from. Like Linda Sarsour, God bless her, like out there all by herself, man. Brother Mahmoud in the 90s, right, who started this idea of protest, right? There has to be infrastructure to be able to support these people in many ways. Allah said, we helped you with our divine aid and we helped you with believers. Sister, could not go to Mexico and have that kind of impact on people without the generous contributions and sacrifices of people. And the last is sacrifice. These are times of sacrifice, man. You know, Imam al-Mawdudi, because we, we cannot ever deny that the roots of Iqna are in the Islamic movement. That word has become taboo because we allowed it to become taboo. There's nothing wrong with saying Islamic movement because the Islamic movement is a movement of mercy, a movement of justice, a movement of accountability. No prophet existed except he held his constituents and he held the society he lived in accountable. Mawlana Maududi said, you will never believe in Islam completely until you care for it like you care for your sick child at night. 
You know, I've been there, my daughter, I've been up at three o'clock in the morning trying to find a CVS, right? Trying to find some medication for my kids, calling doctors at three in the morning, two in the morning. Why are there snot coming out of their nose? Because they're babies. Oh, okay. Having the hymna for the deen, the sacrifice needed, because that sacrifice brings benefit. You look at great, great accomplishments on history, and if you look behind the scenes, you find sacrifice. I'll give you one example. The qira'ah that most of you read with, you call it qira'at hafs. It's not qira'ah of hafs. This is the riwayah of Hafs ibn Sulaiman. The qira'ah belongs to Imam Asim al-Kufi. Imam Asim al-Kufi has narrated to us the qira'ah of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Back to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he also narrated the qira'ah of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. Imam Asim, what made him so famous outside of this qira'ah being the authentic riwayah that goes back to Sayyidina Rasulullah. But why is it everywhere? You know, most Muslims in the world are reading whether they know it or not with Shatabi's tariq of Hafs from Sayyidina Imam Asim al-Kufi. Imam al-Asim's life is a life of struggle. He stood against the Amawis. Like he took on a political position in Kufa in a time where that was very difficult to do. Imam al-Asim, not only did he take a political position, he was blind at birth. Like do you realize you're reading the riwayat of a blind man? That should be a proof if anyone asks you about Islam and Islam's proper engagement with society, you should tell them that seven of the ten Imams of the Qiraat were slaves who were freed. And many of them were people with disabilities. Those are our Imams of the Quran, subhanAllah. Imam al kisai at the end of his life, the only time he could hear is when someone recited the Quran to him. I saw this with Sheikh Irfan in Egypt, a blind man who the only time wallahi he could see is when you open the mushaf in front of him. He could correct you in the mushaf. If you ask him, uh, where's the, the full story? He's like, I, I don't see anything. But if you put the Quran in front of him, can you see Allah too? Subhanallah. Imam Asim is blind, stands for justice, and marries a single mother whose son is named Hafs. So that's why Shatabi in Hirz al Amani says, He says, The best narration of Asim's qira'ah is Hafs. I asked my teacher this. Why? He said, Because Imam Asim married Hafs mother who was a divorcee and had this child. A blind man who takes on the political establishment and marries a single mother with a child. And now you see that qira'ah everywhere. The point is, nothing happens without sacrifice. It just doesn't happen because you're like, you're cool or you're awesome. People send me messages all the time on Instagram. Hey man, follow me. Why? I don't know because like I'm, I'm me. No, that's not how it works, man. You, you've got to earn respect. So we talk about the quest for success. Uh, I think Ikna is doing really a fabulous job. Look at the diversity of the panelists. This is very deliberate. They don't wait for people to protest and then get diverse. They're diverse. They have diversity years ago. Number two is they've stayed true to the Islamic movement. Uh, I know that's a dangerous term. You know why it's a dangerous term? Because we gave it to Bill O'Reilly. 
We should own our tradition, not give our tradition to people. Because they have no love for our tradition. And when I say that, what I mean is they've stayed, tra stayed true to a more balanced, conservative articulation of Islam. And that's not easy to do. I might not, not even agree sometimes with everything that I see, but I respect that. The third is that they give people the platform. You know, I was in Boston, I saw the work sister Malika did to open up this woman's shelter. People thought she was crazy. And she did it, mashallah, by the help and guidance of Ikna. I was in the Bay Area when brothers from Hyderabad, India, new Americans, Donald Trump wants to talk about how new Americans are impacting America. Here's one in the Bay Area where our brothers from India have started a dental, the only way I can describe it is like a dental, dental trailer on wheels. It just goes through neighborhoods with dentists who inside this trailer are two like full-fledged dental labs where you can get your teeth examined and your teeth cleaned. You talk about homeless people, especially people using meth, uh, the lowest common denominator economically in this country, the first sign usually of that is your teeth. You talk about the work that Brother Qasim with Ikna Relief and Helping Hand is doing. I was just in New Orleans, mashallah, a few weeks ago with Helping Hand. They've done more than $30,000 worth of projects alone in West Africa. Creating platforms that people can be encouraged to sacrifice because Allah equipped the Prophet. He was ready to sacrifice because he had eloquent speech. Allah had given him refined character and morality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made him extremely brave. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was extremely intelligent. Fatana. Sallallahu alayhi wa So he's equipped to make sacrifice. And Allah reminds him, And then the last is that each and every one of us can make some sacrifices in our community. Volunteering for parent-teacher association, being a football or soccer coach if you have time, engaging people in the community, especially now that things are going to start getting cut. Not this year, but next year. We're going to see a large cut in social services because the poor are expected to pay for the rich. And in the face of that, we have to react and begin to sacrifice ourselves so that we can help others. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless the work that ICNA continues to do and bless the community of Atlanta. This is the home of Morehouse and Spellman. This is the home of Dominique Wilkins, the human highlight film. MashaAllah. There is a lot of history in this incredible city. May Allah bless you and allow you to contribute in ways that are meaningful and powerful. Salaam alaikum. You are the best people evolved for mankind because you enjoin the good and you forbid the evil. America's greatest chance, without a doubt, are the Muslims who do their job. Let us be very, very clear that our presence here in the United States of America is the best thing that ever happened to this country. The Islamophobia industry is spending millions of dollars to demonize Islam for one reason and that is to break away your confidence from your faith because it recognizes that your faith is the source of our success and strength as Muslims and as human beings in this country. Our job is simply to show the oneness of Allah. That's our struggle and if we do that, America benefits. We live in a country where we need to understand our history as Muslims. Islam has been on the shores of this nation since the days of its founding. This country right here is our country and we deserve to live here like everybody else.